Okay, let's continue the modification of the expression further, because you'll see the reason why there is why, why there is a need for further simplification. Modification, sorry. <clears throat> now the electrons. This density of states that I have substituted for the energy conserving delta is associated for the electrons moving in any direction, all directions. But actually, in order to observe this, to measure and observe, observe and measure this uh, outgoing electron, you have to think of those going in the direction of a certain solid angle because you have to put the detector somewhere and therefore if you put the detector somewhere in the uh, somewhere in outside then obviously you have to take that into account this is in all the this expression is valid for electrons moving in all directions Actually, I will focus on the electrons moving in the, the d omega direction. Omega is the solid angle. And then, uh, so I have to modify the expression saying that if this rho EF is associated with the electrons going in all directions, that's in the 4 pi solid angle. So if I focus on the those going in the d omega directions and that number should be what? That number should be d omega divided by 4 pi times the rho, right? Obviously. So now, as I'm I, I have introduced a solid angle, then the, the exact notation should be the d sigma. And then it should be d sigma is 4 pi squared alpha times h bar divided by m squared omega times this matrix element squared. Again, let me denote this matrix element with this fni squared. Times rho ef. times d omega divided by 4 pi. You see, instead of the rho, I have substituted for this and I denote it as d sigma and the, the focusing only on the electrons moving in the d omega direction. Where? Ah, uh, yeah, it is to be taken at the EF equals EF equals EI plus H bar omega. Obviously, that is always the energy conservation is to be imposed. This is the FI. Good. The capital F is the amplitude. The little f and I are the states, initial and final states. Now, at the end of the day, now we have to move this d omega to the left, and because that's the customary expression they look at at the experiments, write it at d sigma over d omega, moving this there, and we have then dividing by the 4 pi, pi alpha times h bar divided by m squared, m squared omega. F, Fi squared rho EF with energy conservation. So we are really now at an intermediate step. We have the expression that we have to use to, uh, but there are several things we have to settle yet. This density of final states of the free electron is one challenge that we have to compute. And of course, once we are finished with that, 
we have to also compute that dynamical part that is the, uh, the that complicated operator sandwiched between the initial electronic state and free final free uh, electron state. So we, put, we leave it aside for the time being. Now we focus our attention on the computation of density of final states of the free electron. So my next job is free electrons. Free electrons are supposed to be the simplest entities in quantum theory, right? In principle. There are no potentials to worry about and it's just the kinetic energy, the exclusively the only e Hamiltonian is composed of the kinetic energy. So E equals, or Hamiltonian, so P squared over 2M. Solving this problem is obviously a trivial one because the energy eigen, uh, eigenstates are determined by solving the Schrodinger equation for this free Hamiltonian. Okay, I'm not going to go through the details because you have been seeing this from uh, many courses in the past. So what we have is that if I now go to the x psi free, which is if I denote it as pf, is normalization coefficient ei over h bar pf dot x. That is the plane wave solution which comes out of the Schrodinger equation simply. I have put this notation on purpose because that's the, from fundamental conceptual point of view, it's an important label. What we have done is the following. We are looking for the eigenstates of the free Hamiltonian it's energy eigenstates. But as p squared commutes with the p, these are also the momentum eigenstates. So this one, if I use the conventional notation as well, psi pf of x, as the conventional Schrodinger notation, in our abstract Hilbert space notation is equivalent to this one. So, this one are simultaneous eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian and the momentum operator. Well, you may think it's a trivial statement. Well, it is. Because the, any component of the momentum operator commutes with the square of itself. So uh, it is not only an energy eigenstate, it's also a momentum eigenstate for all the three components. Thus, momentum can be specified precisely in this eigenstate. That's the consequence, right? Momenta, momentum is an operator, a vector operator, so momenta can be specified. Well, that's a sophisticated terminology, and you can say measured if you want. Measured. Exactly. In this state. What is the consequence of this strong statement? If momentum can be measured precisely with 100% certainty, then position is fully uncertain. Position is fully uncertain. Where is the object? Anywhere on the front. If it's a plane front, it could be anywhere, in principle, even at the infinity. 
It can escape, it can escape to the infinity. If it can escape to the infinity, you cannot normalize it. It's a very fundamental problem. And you face with that fundamental problem at the simplest example. So the consequence of that, that the momentum, any, any component of momentum can be measured exactly, means positions are fully uncertain. You have a plane in front, it extends to infinity, obviously you don't know where the particle is. but it explains the fundamental difficulty. Let me tell you what that fundamental difficulty is. Here is the wave function in the x basis. I have to normalize, that is I have to determine the n. So the usual conventional normalization in order to give it a meaning quantum mechanically, conventional normalization transcription is 1 is equal to d cube x psi pf x squared. That should be 1. But this one is n times e to the i over h bar pf dot x. When you take the mod squared, this is 1, so it is n squared d cube x. infinite. There, there is no place to confine it. It's free particle. It can go anywhere. It can be anywhere, so it is infinite. Meaning, you cannot normalize it in this manner. What kind of mistake we are doing? The point is that we are not, we are not doing a mistake. It is a fundamental problem of the quantum mechanics. So you cannot avoid this problem, you can go around this. You cannot avoid it, you have to find a way of living together with this difficulty. That's called the regularization. So we have to develop the regularization method. That is, respecting this difficulty, but still enabling you to handle these objects. If you, want, you don't want to exclude the free particles altogether out of the scope of the quantum theory, right? If you say, throw out the free particles, I am only concerned with the non-free objects in quantum theory. But that's not a consistent physical theory. So you have to live with this difficulty. And one way out is Dirac's way of normalization. That's a recipe. Then you point, split the points and you define the normalization integral as d cube x psi pf of x psi pf prime of x delta cube pf pf prime. If you coincide them, put them together by setting pf prime is equal to pf, what you get? Infinite. Ah, that's good. You, you, you are supposed to be getting infinity anyway. As I said, you have to live together with that difficulty. You are not trying to eliminate this. So going to that, to that limit, you, should, you really get infinity as you should. But is, does that give you a recipe for uh, normalization, it indeed does. If I now substitute the explicit expression there, n squared d cube x e to the i over minus i over h bar pf pf prime dotted into x is what you get in the left hand side with that explicit solution. 
so plugged in. And in the right hand side, what you have is this. And what is it? It is, you can write it in the form of an integral representation. Delta has many representations, so you can write it as d cube x e to the i pf pf prime dot of into x. You say no. Dimensionally, that's not the right thing you should do. First of all, if it was just the inverse dimension of x in here, so that it's multiplied into x giving you a dimensionless number, it's fine. So in order to make it dimensionless, you put that in here. Normally, I would have a 2 pi cube if it was the p divided by h is used as k. But now I'm using that one, so it's this one. In the unit system, h bar is set equal to zero. Life is comfortable. You don't have to worry about these subtleties. But when you have uh, using full constants all the time to distinguish the momentum with the wave vector, as you have pointed out, then of course, when it's the p's, it's the I h bar in here. When you are using k, the, if the label is the wave vector, not the momentum, then of course, it is the no h bar in there. If you compare these two expressions using the fact that Dirac delta is symmetrical in the entry, the delta of x is the same as delta of minus x. Therefore, this mismatch in the signs of the exponential is no problem. Then you get n equals up to a phase 2 pi h bar to the minus 3 halves. Up to a phase, I say, because it's the norm that you determine. But if your norm is multiplied by an arbitrary phase, you know that in wave functions, it's always determined up to a phase. Expectation values enter psi and psi star, and it's, it's ambiguous up to a phase. So the, in this recipe, in this prescription, the free particle solution becomes 2 pi h bar minus 3 halves e to the i over h bar pf dot x. Is it normalized? It is normalized in this sense. Indeed, when pf and pf prime coincide, then you get the infinity as you should. Well, this, is a, this type of normalization is very widely used in the scattering problems. As if we are going to have time to discuss the scattering, I will use this particular normalization. Uh, by the way, although in this curriculum, we have listed scattering coming immediately after this subject. As I have done in the past, I will postpone it to the last week or last two weeks. And I will rush into relatives to quantum mechanics because we don't want, we want, don't want to miss anything in that. And then we'll stop at a certain point in relatives to quantum mechanics and go back to scattering theory in the last two weeks or so and complete that. So pedagogically, it is not the, the, the most desirable approach, but for time concerns, I, I'm going to follow that path. So be prepared for that. So this is, as I said, in a, a normalization which is used in the scattering problems very widely. But I will develop another now normalization prescription it's the second one is called the box normalization. And let's go through that. It is a very beautiful prescription, really, and fundamentally very profound. So the second one is box normalization. You may say, what box? There's no box in here. Of course, there's no box in here. So we are going to make it up virtually in our minds. Let's do that. The box, let me plot a two-dimensional picture just for the convenience. As I said, I cannot do such pictures in three dimensions easily in here. So imagine our space, three-dimensional space, is filled in with cells of size L in each direction. It may not be the most beautiful picture that you have seen, but uh, 
put us all over there. Anyway, 2L, 3L, L, 2L, 3L. So think of these Ls. L is this new scale I am introducing. And imagine that there are such walls filling in this room as well. What is the size of the L? I don't know. Then you say, if you don't know, why are you introducing it? Okay, that's a good reason. If we can demonstrate that, although there are such walls, sort of virtual walls filling in this room, if they are not detectable, if we cannot measure or detect them through observation, then be that it, they can stay in there. So we impose the periodic boundary conditions. Boundary conditions. What do I mean? I impose, as I said, impose is an important word. It's, we are doing it, they are not there. That the wave function should have the same value in all the walls, if we go away, L, 2L, 3L, 4L, in one direction, the wave function will have the same value. So dropping all the indices and everything to simplify the picture. In this direction, and psi, y, psi, y plus l, psi, y plus 2l, and similarly in the z. We impose this, that they are at the same value. Compared to actual physical box, remember if you had a box of psi, a cubic box, say, uh, in, in size l in all three directions, there was a physical boundary condition. It's not imposed by us, it is forced upon us the, intrinsically that the wave function should vanish on the walls. Why? If it is zero outside and non-zero inside, it must, there must be a continuation, right? The wave function and its first derivative should vanish on the wall. So it wasn't the imposed, it was imposed by the very nature of the problem for the physical box. It is not a physical box, it is a virtual box in our minds. And it's not vanishing of the wave function, it is that they are equal to each other. That's, a, that's also another fundamental difference. But they are going to lead to the same kind of quantization rules. You say, quantization? Yes. Strange, indeed so. But we are going to have some quantization-like conditions as a result of these conditions. Let me demonstrate. If you take these two, e to the i over h bar, pf x. Now let me drop the sub-index pf, px is equal to e to the i over h bar px x plus l. Now what do you get from here? 1 is equal to e to the i over h bar px l. And what is 1? They compose it into 2 and x pi, then you get what? You get from here, px is equal to 2 <coughs> nx 2 pi over l. You repeat it for this, all the other factors canceled, you do it for the y, you get something like py is equal to ny 2 pi over l. And similarly, you get it for the pz, and z 2 pi over l. That's the quantization rules I was talking about, which are sort of surprising, because you would get such conditions if you really indeed confine the object in a box, physical box of size l, centered at the origin, you would get similar conditions. Oh, by the way, Px, Px over h bar to write it, okay. <coughs> Modify this, you know, this h bars. Good, if so, if so. Ns are integers, one, two, three, etc. Plus, minus, 
because they give different type of. So each triplet of px, py, pz, or converted into each triplet of nx and y and z defines a state. nx and y and z defines a state. What state? Free particle state, right? The, the, the physical problem under consideration. And what is the energy? Energy is p squared over 2m. So it is 4 pi squared h bar squared divided by 2m nx squared and y squared and z squared. We can work out several things like degeneracies, etc. Let me not get into those things because it's beyond the level of our concern. So this is each triplet gives you a different state. Here is the energy expressed in terms of nx and y and nz. So the, our, one of our main purposes is, first of all, to define normalization to compute density of states. Third, a philosophical question to check whether L is physical or not. Of course, there are three issues in front of us. We have obtained some very gratifying simple expressions that like moment are related to some integers and besides I can by specifying triplets I can define a state however these issues should be addressed let me start with the third one because it's the more fundamental one if we can really detect the L and measure it through some observations then uh, we have to really look at the nature and discuss the discover it as one of the fundamental constants of the universe. Like the C, H bar, and Planck constant, there are several constants, right, in the universe, like the electronic charge, and we should also say there's a fundamental scale in the universe. And actual space is not continuous, there's a cellular nature, there's lattice. Some of you probably have seen that there are lattice computations carried out in gauge theories. Perhaps there are lattices in the space, is it? Well, how do I detect and measure? What I have to do is actually go to the point in the x direction to the point L, and all the rest of the coordinates are set equal to zero, and to L, and go to those points exactly, and measure the wave function. Well, the wave function was a simultaneous eigenfunction of energy and the momentum. Meaning, not only energy is 100% specified, the momentum is 100% specified, and the positions are fully uncertain. We don't know where the particles are. So when you go to a specific point x equals l, that is, position is fully certain, the momentum is fully uncertain. It, this wave function is not describing that particle anymore. This particle describes the object with the specified momentum, not specified position. So I cannot go to that point or that point and com uh, compute the wave function and compare against. That wave function is not the wave function which gives you the exact position of the particle. So, L's 
are not physical because cannot be determined. True observations. That's a beautiful statement indeed. So if they're not physical, if we cannot detect them, then we can use it mathematically without really spoiling anything. Let's turn our attention to the normalization. How do I define a normalization with the help of this? If, there's none, if these are not physical, and I can use it at the intermediate level to carry out computations, and at the end of the day, for instance, I, let, I, I can let that go to infinity. If it is a mathematical entity, I'm free to adjust it any way I like. So, let me do the normalization now. You see how beautiful it is. So, box normalization prescription is to go to the central cube and normalize it in that central cube only. What is the right hand side? n squared times d cube x central cube. What is this volume? L cube. So what is n? Up to a phase, L to the minus 3 halves. So what is the accordingly normalized in this prescription? Wave function PF of x is e to, sorry, L to the minus 3 halves is times I over h bar PF dotted into x. You just use this, and at the end of the day, you let L go to infinity to cover the entire space. At the intermediate level, you avoid the singularity, and if at the end of the at the end of the day you you can let it go to infinity freely, then beautiful, wonderful, can be. We'll see that example in the photoelectric effect. They are going so we, we are free to manipulate it any way we like. So this is also a beautifully uh, consistent normalization, safe normalization, avoiding the infinity and enabling you to carry out physical computations without throwing the free particle away from the quantum mechanical framework. You keep the free particle in quantum mechanics, you avoid the difficulty, and you finish all the computations. Okay, wonderful. Now what about the, the second one? Density of states. Let's, let me compute the density of states using this. Well, we'll do the following. We said that each triplet of n's integers define a state for you. So let me go to the n space. And in this space, I will consider again a lattice. Well, this time no problem because the number space, it's not a physical space, it's a number space. So I'm free to choose lattices, any, the cells, any way I like. Now the walls of the lattice, the, the walls will be sitting at the half integer points. Half integer, that is. One half, one half, three halves, five halves, similarly, one half, three halves, five halves. 
Why do I do that? You look at this point. This is one zero. There's also a minus a half point. This is again a zero one half. This is one and one. So centers, if I take the walls at half integer points, centers are integers. Okay, so walls at half integers so that centers at integers. Clear, right? That's, nothing could be simpler than this. The center of at each cube, we have triplet, uh, integers, triplet of integers. Say 1, 1, 1, or 1, 1, 2, or 2, 2, 1, whatever, at the centers. So what is the advantage of this thing? So each cube, I can uh, think of each cube representing a state. A state is associated with the triplet at the center of that cube. So let's ask the following physical question. What is the density of states associated with a given E. So it's a function of E. So you have to ask the density of states at a particular value of E. So if we consider this, remember that this, this spherical surface describes for you the energy expression in terms of these numbers, right? If I write, we write that as an x squared plus n y squared plus n z squared as equal to 2 m l squared times e 4 pi squared h bar squared times e. But for given e, that's the point, right? What are the number of states associated, num density of states associated with the e? e is given, these are constants. So that part is a constant that describes a spherical surface. Spherical surface in the number space. An x squared plus and y squared plus and z squared is a constant, is a two sphere, right? In that number space. So if I now consider a shell of thickness. delta n. This is the n. I move to n plus delta n by uh, taking that shell. What is the volume of this shell? Volume of shell is 4 pi n squared times delta n. 4 pi n squared is the area of the surface. Delta n is the width. So this is the volume of that shell. How many cells are there in this shell? Number of cells. Is equal to, let me denote this as delta N, capital N. Delta N divided by one cube, because each volume is one cube. So if I divide the volume of the shell by the cube of the one, I get the number of cells. Number of cells, each cell de described through the triplet at the center of it is a state, independent state. So this is the number of states. Wonderful. So what is that number of states, delta N? is equal to this one. Good. So let's compute this. Should we take the first both terms of the shell? Why? Because we are in the first the first integers. Are we? exponentials. Box is sines and cosines. Sine is odd, cosine is even. So there are such problems there. Here, we are, we are not in a box. And we should consider plus and minuses together. 
You know, there are fundamental differences. Quantization conditions being identical is really sort of forcing you to make that interpretation. That's a wonderful comment. Sometimes I ask this difference in the exams. What is the fundamental difference between box and the periodic boundary condition for a free particle? So Kamil's question is a very wonderful one. I invite you to think on your own. Is it the octant or the full sphere I have to consider? Convince yourselves that it is the entire sphere itself. Okay, so here is the expression n squared, and I have to consider the n squared times delta n. So I need delta n first. So what is n there if I compute the n? So it is 2m l squared divided by 4 pi squared h bar squared square root e square root. So that's the n. So delta n is what? Delta n is that constant square root is here, one half delta e divided by the e. So that's the delta n. So if I now compute the capital delta n, it's the number in the number of states inside the shell is equal to 4 pi, is that 4 pi is there, n squared, 2 ml squared, divided by 4 pi squared, h bar squared. And there is a factor of 1 half coming from here, making it 3 halves. So there is an e coming there, and there is 1 over square root of e, so 1 over 2 square root of e divided by 2 times delta e. So that's the number delta n. What is the density of final states? Density of states, rather, here. It is the number of states per unit energy interval. Therefore, if I divide this delta n by the delta e, it gives me the indeed row I am looking for, right? Delta n divided by delta e is rho e. Here 2 pi, here 2 ml squared divided by 4 pi squared h bar squared 3 halves times the square root of e. So the number of density of states, that's the number of states per unit energy interval for a three-dimensional free particle is proportional to the square root of e. In the past, I have also required the students to check it is the two space dimensions and one space dimension and check whether that energy dependence changes. Is this a specific property of the three space dimensions that is proportional square root of e? It, it is, right? When you go to one dimension, it's one over the square root of e, correct? Then you go to two space dimensions constant. Beautiful. So enjoy yourself a little bit with these kind of games. Huh? So this is not a universal relation. This is true only in the three space dimensions. So we have done all the three tasks. We have a, a beautifully consistent normalization condition. We have checked that L is not physical, it's just mathematical. So we can adjust it any way we like. We just choose a specific value and then let it go to infinity at the end of the day. And we know how to compute the density of states. To make it look much better, let me do the following. There's L squared and 4 pi squared h bar squared. I will write it in 3 halves. It is L cube divided by 2 pi h bar cube, right, squared and 3, three halves. Well, when you see some books, this is the so-called phase space factor, beautifully written. And, but the rest may not look that beautiful. There is a 2 pi in here, and 2 m 3 halves, and the square root of e. If I write the square root of e in terms of the momenta, or rather the wave vector, I write this as h bar squared k squared divided by the 2 m. So what do I have then? I have L cube divided by 2 pi h bar cube times 2 pi h bar, which will kill one of the factors in here. 2 m 3 halves, 2 m 1 halves, good, there's 2 m and the kf. 
Well, this looks a little nicer because then I can write it at L cube divided by 2 pi h bar squared times 2m kf. So that's the density of states for the free particle we are going to use next week in when we have the expression ready for the differential cross-section. Everything is ready, so we have to compute the dynamics, the matrix element squared and finish the cross-section. So it's a good point to stop, I guess, indeed.